welcome everyone. Today, in our lesson about energy and chemical change, we will see what is required for a reaction to take place. We know how to classify chemical reactions by the energy change that takes place. An exothermic reaction is a reaction that releases energy to the surroundings. And an endothermic reaction is one that absorbs energy from the surroundings. We also know how to draw energy diagrams for these reactions. But we need to find out why we draw this bump between the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products. Nelly will tell us more. We begin today's lesson by looking carefully at this ordinary match. It is made up of carbon, sulfur and phosphorus. All these substances react with oxygen which is in the air around us. But I could leave this match on the chair all day and nothing would happen. Why? Because the surroundings don't contain the right amount of energy in the correct form to kickstart a reaction. To get a reaction between the oxygen and the substances in the match, I need to supply a small amount of energy. By pulling the tip of the match over the surface of the box, the friction produces a small amount of heat. This heat energy is sufficient to start or activate the reaction. Because of this, we say it is activation energy. Once the chemical reaction has started, it generates more heat and as new products form, this heat is released into the surroundings. We see this in the form of a flame and can feel the heat produced as the match burns. Can you identify what type of reaction this is? When the match burns, light and heat energy is released. So it is an exothermic reaction. We will go back to Nelly in a moment. Let's look carefully at the definition of activation energy. Activation energy is the minimum energy required to start a chemical reaction. The symbol that is used for the activation energy is capital letter E with a subscript A. Since it is a form of energy, the unit is kilojoules per mole. Nelly's match ignited because the friction against the box produced enough energy in the form of heat to start the reaction. Remember that when a match burns, the carbon, sulfur, and phosphorus all react with oxygen in a combustion reaction to produce light and heat. To simplify things, Nelly considers only pure carbon in pure oxygen. This lump of carbon does not react with oxygen unless heat is applied. As the temperature of the carbon increases, it glows bright orange. When placed into a gas jar of pure oxygen, it ignites. To get a clearer idea of all the energy changes taking place during this chemical reaction, let's have a closer look at what's happening at a microscopic level. Each oxygen molecule in the air is a diatomic molecule with two atoms. There's a strong double bond between these atoms. A single carbon atom in the lump of carbon is held in place by four covalent bonds joining it to other carbon atoms. Chemical potential energy is stored in all of these chemical bonds. Oxygen molecules in the air are in constant motion, so before the chemical reaction takes place, these molecules often collided with the carbon atoms in the carbon block. But they didn't have enough energy to break the bonds between the carbon atoms and form new substances. So no reaction took place. When the Bunsen burner gives additional heat energy to the reactants, oxygen and carbon, the collisions become more violent. There is now enough energy to weaken, but not totally break, the chemical bonds within the reactants. Although the carbon atoms and oxygen atoms try to stick together, there is still not enough energy to form permanent new bonds. Thank you, Nelly. That explains it very well. But what happens to the carbon atoms and oxygen atoms? They are in an unstable state which is called an activated complex. This unstable activated complex holds the energy of the reactants, oxygen and carbon, P 
plus the heat energy of the Bunsen burner and thus has more potential energy than the reactants alone. At this stage, two outcomes are possible. Firstly, the activation complex may break up, in which case, in this case, the reactants may not undergo any permanent change. Or secondly, the old chemical bonds between the carbon atoms and the oxygen atoms may break up and new bonds may form. If new bonds form, energy is released and a new substance forms. In our example, carbon and oxygen combine to form carbon dioxide with the formula CO2. How do we calculate the energy involved in this reaction? Remember, the solid carbon forms gaseous carbon before it reacts with the oxygen atoms. The chemical reaction that takes place is solid carbon reacts with oxygen gas to form carbon dioxide. The solid carbon absorbs energy to go into the gaseous phase and the diatomic oxygen absorbs energy to form free atoms before carbon dioxide forms. Let's look again at molecular models to represent the molecules. Then original carbon and oxygen bonds are broken and new bonds start to form. This is a very unstable state with a lot of potential energy. Finally, the new bonds form and lots of energy is released to the surroundings. The product is now stable. Now we use bond energies to calculate the heat of reaction. The information about bond energies is in a table in the series guide. To change carbon solid to carbon gas takes 715 kilojoules per mole. 498 kilojoules per mole is needed to break the oxygen double bond and the formation of a carbon oxygen double bond releases 803 kilojoules per mole. Remember, there are two carbon oxygen double bonds in one carbon dioxide molecule. Here is the formula to calculate the heat of reaction. Try the calculation before you look at the answer. Did you get minus 393 kilojoules? Let's go through it. Delta H is equal to the sum of the energy changes when the bonds break, minus the sum of the energy released when the new bonds form. The bonds that break are when the solid carbon changes to gaseous carbon and the double bond between the oxygen atoms. The bonds that form are two carbon oxygen double bonds. So, 715 plus 498 kilojoules of energy is required to break the bonds and 2 times 803 kilojoules is released when the new bonds form. The answer is negative 393 kilojoules. So we know that this is an exothermic reaction that releases 393 kilojoules to the environment. We can now draw an energy diagram for this reaction. We draw the x-axis as the reaction coordinate and the y-axis as the potential energy in kilojoules. The carbon and oxygen had a certain amount of potential energy before the reaction started. We indicate the energy of the reactants with a horizontal line. To start the reaction, activation energy, E subscript A, is absorbed from the surroundings in the form of heat from the Bunsen burner. We represent this energy by drawing in a vertical line. Now we can draw in the energy of the activated complex as another horizontal line. The activated complex forms new bonds and energy is released. More energy is released to the surroundings than the energy that is absorbed, so the energy of the products is lower than the energy of the reactants. The potential chemical energy of the products is indicated on the graph with a third horizontal line. It is drawn lower down on the energy axis. Can you see that there is a difference in the potential energy of the reactants and the potential energy of the products? This difference is indicated by the green vertical line, and we know that it is the heat of the reaction, delta H. What happened to this potential energy? Since energy cannot be destroyed, it has changed from potential energy to kinetic energy of the particles in the surroundings. 
we observe this as an increase in temperature in the surroundings and light coming from the match. Up to now, we have drawn vertical lines to represent the changes in energy. However, the energy gradually increases or decreases during the reaction. And so the graph representing the progress of the reaction with time should actually be curved. Here we see the reactants carbon and oxygen gradually form the activated complex. The activated complex lasts only a moment before it gradually breaks up and forms the product. Energy is released to form the carbon dioxide product and the difference in energy, delta H, is negative 393 kilojoules per mole. Now let's turn our attention to an endothermic reaction. Nelly will tell us more. Remember, an endothermic reaction is one in which more energy is absorbed than is released into the surroundings. When red mercury oxide is heated, the compound decomposes to form mercury and oxygen. The enthalpy of this reaction is equal to 90,7 kilojoules per mole of mercury formed. You might like to use an energy diagram to describe the energy changes taking place. Here is my diagram. The potential energy of the reactants is indicated by the horizontal line low down on the energy axis. The activation energy required for this reaction was large, so the horizontal line representing the potential energy of the activation complex is much higher than the energy of the reactants. When the products form in an endothermic reaction, we won't observe energy being released. This means that some of the activation energy was stored as potential energy in the products. So the products have more potential energy than the reactants, represented by this horizontal line showing that the energy of the products is higher than the energy of the reactants. The enthalpy or overall difference in energy between the products and reactants, delta H, is represented by the vertical green line. To calculate delta H, we subtract the energy of the products from the energy of the reactants. Notice that the enthalpy value is greater than zero, which is true for all endothermic chemical reactions. In this chemical reaction, the enthalpy is equal to 90,7 kilojoules per mole. There is one thing left to do, and that is to find out what the effect of a catalyst is on the energy dynamics of a reaction. We will do a quick experiment to show you what a catalyst does, so let's go to the lab. For this experiment, we need 20% per volume hydrogen peroxide, a flat bottom flask, and manganese dioxide. If hydrogen peroxide is left open in a container, it decomposes to oxygen and water and heat energy is released over a period of time. But see what happens here. We wrap the flat bottom flask in aluminium foil. Now we add hydrogen peroxide. A teaspoon of manganese dioxide is measured off. When the stopper is removed from the flask, we add the spoonful of manganese 4 oxide at once. Stand aside because the vigorous reaction follows. A large amount of water vapor and oxygen emerges from the flask. That was spectacular, but safety precautions should be taken. Hydrogen peroxide is a strong oxidizing agent, therefore contact with eyes and skin should be avoided. Do not stand over the flask because the reaction is exothermic and the steam forms quickly and the flask becomes considerably hot. Let me explain what happened. A catalyst was added. It altered the rate of the chemical reaction but remained chemically unchanged at the end of the process. The catalyst increases the rate of a chemical reaction by lowering the reaction activation energy. The products form faster since an alternate lower energy pathway is available for the reaction to occur. In the presence of manganese dioxide, Hydrogen peroxide catalytically decomposes to water and oxygen according to this equation. The reaction is exothermic with the energy given off being sufficient for water evaporation. Therefore, 
white steam forms that consists of water droplets propelled from the bottle by the oxygen gas. We can represent this reaction on an energy diagram. The green curve represents the reaction using a catalyst. The red curve is without a catalyst. Remember that the catalyst lowers the activation energy of the reaction so that the reaction takes place faster. This brings us to the end of our series on energy and chemical change. Be sure to practice some questions from the task video to prepare you for the tests and exams. You can also look at the Mindset website on www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn. Goodbye.